Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Mountain Network's first ever International Mountain Day live stream. I'm Meg Wilcox. I'm currently at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, but for the next hour, I'll be connecting you to some of the mountain communities that are celebrating International Mountain Day. We'll head up to Haines Junction in Yukon Territory. We'll stop by Canada's two towns and national parks, Banff and Jasper, and we'll even check in with some mountain webcams to see what's happening at higher altitudes. Now, the United Nations first declared International Mountain Day in 2003, and ever since, on December 11th, communities from around the world come together to celebrate and bring awareness to the world's mountain environments and the people and cultures that inhabit them. You'll see lots of groups today that are celebrating in different ways, and hopefully it'll give you a taste of some of the ways our mountain cultures nearby are celebrating right now. First, we are going to head to Marmot Basin. Erin Reed is out on the hill. Erin, how are you doing? Hi there, how are you, Meg? Oh, I'm so good. Is it cold out? It is a little chilly, yeah, but it's uh, trying to snow a little bit at the moment, which has been very lovely. Wonderful. Are lots of people out? I see a few skiers behind you. Yeah, absolutely. You can see a few people coming down, but it's almost lunchtime now, so the, the chalet <laughs> behind me is a little bit full. <laughs> For sure. So the days are getting shorter and shorter at this point. Uh, we have the solstice coming up in about 10 days. I hear you guys have something special planned for that. Yeah, we're celebrating with a evening dinner at our Eagle Chalet. So that's the Mid-Mountain Chalet. Uh, so we're going to have a three-course meal up there and then a, a nighttime ski down under headlamps, which should be super fun. Wonderful. Now, you are under a light sky preserve, I believe, right? Or a night sky preserve. A yeah, a dark sky preserve. There we go. Yeah, yes. So we're actually in the second largest dark sky preserve in the world, actually. Um, the, the, uh, the first largest or the largest is uh, in Alberta as well. Uh, Elk, uh, Elk National Park, Elk Island National Elk Park. Island, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we are the only dark sky preserve with uh, a town completely within the, the confines of the dark sky preserve. And uh, yeah, Jasper is a beautiful place to come out and experience the mountains and uh, see the stars and potentially the northern lights. Wonderful. So it will be a dark ride down is what you're saying for everyone on the 21st. It will be a dark <laughs> ride down, yes. But that's why the headlamps are handy. But uh, before we ride down, I'm sure we'll be able to cast our gaze up into the heavens and have a look at all those beautiful stars. And hopefully uh, we'll be a little lucky and see some northern lights on that night. Oh, wonderful. Now, there's a lot yeah. of wildlife that you can see around Marmot Basin. You were telling me the other day that you actually saw a, a mama lynx. Yeah, I did, yes. As I was driving down the mountain, I one turn from the hill and there was a mama lynx and her little kitten. It was very adorable. But uh, yeah, I've actually skied uh, not not too far from here with a lynx in the trees next to me. Uh, we also get deer up here. And uh, the, last season, like the last day of the season last year, we had a grizzly bear on the hill. So uh, lots of wildlife up here. I think that's one of the wonderful things about Jasper National Park and Marmot Basin is how connected we are to the wildlife up here. And and uh, how accessible it is, yeah. Wonderful, and are there any animals, you mentioned the grizzly last season, are there some that tend to stick around for a while? Like that you see regularly? Oh, nice. Yeah, good, good, good of you to mention this. We had a caribou up here uh, two seasons ago now. His name was Frankie Thunderbolt because he loved to hang out in Thunderbolt, which <laughs> is up off the Eagle Ridge chairs that are up. You can't really see it at the moment because of the, the snow gun behind me. Uh, but he, you know, caribou are quite rare in Jasper National Park, and he loved it here and just hung out for the season. And, uh, you know, it was great for our guests. They got to see a wild caribou in the wild. and. Uh, uh, it was very accessible, yeah. Right, well, you guys had a name for Frankie. I wonder if he had a name for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the humans that keep the wolves away, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> There's people with weird sticks on their feet. I don't understand. Yeah, right? <laughs> they like sliding around on the snow. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, maybe that's what he came for. Maybe he was jealous and he wanted to ski or snowboard too. <laughs> that's, that's always a possibility. Now, how are you yeah. working this year at getting more people to come up and visit Marmot? Well, you know, obviously we have a wonderful product here, great skiing, great snowboarding, and we'd really love for as many people to come up and enjoy it as possible. Uh, so this year we've uh, got a brand new card program called the Marmot Escape Card, uh, and $75, it gets you 50% off skiing 
all season long. So no blackouts, no counting the days to work out which days you get discounts. 50% off every single day of the season. And uh, it's, we're hoping that it's going to make skiing a little bit more accessible for everyone. There's some other great discounts involved, including discounts on accommodation in Jasper. You've got discounts uh, on the Edmonton Ski Hills. So Snow Valley, uh, Edmonton Ski Club, Sun Ridge and uh, Rabbit Hill are all offering 50% off skiing with the Marmot Escape card as well. And then we're also offering discounts at the Hill on rentals and lessons and some food and some retail. It really is a great card to try and encourage people to come up and either ski more often than they usually would or try it for the first or second time and get out here and enjoy the mountains and enjoy the sliding on snow that we all love so much. It really is a great experience up here. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing the mountain yeah. today and letting us get a bit of a peek of what's it like up at Marmot. Yeah, uh, happy International Mountain Day. Thank you, Erin. That's Erin okay. Reed, and she is at Marmot Basin today, where we can see that the snowblowers are in full effect. And let's check in now with some webcams. We do have some access to some webcams across uh, Alberta, BC, the Yukon right now. This is Marmot Basin, I believe. We're looking from above, seeing some of the skiers make their way down. Unfortunately, no caribou right now <laughs> visible from the webcam at Marmot Basin. Now, Marmot Basin has 86 runs on their four mountain faces. They have a lift capacity of close to 12,000 skiers per hour on seven lifts. And their season normally runs from mid-November to early May, so they still have a lot of good skiing ahead of them. It's only December. We've got another shot here from Aaron Reed. This is checking out Marmot Basin. You can see some of the borders down at the bottom. Looks like some hungry skiers heading in to the lodge. But a great shot there. And we're going to head to Haynes Junction now. Haynes Junction right now, let me pull up the weather here. It is currently a chill, a brisk, minus 25 degrees Celsius. It's snowing right now in Haynes Junction. They're also celebrating International Mountain Day today. And uh, Ellen Belowski, or Belowski is part of the Canadian Mountain Network Yukon, but she was mentioning that the broadband connection's a bit tenuous. We weren't sure if we were going to be able to reach anyone live for today's live stream. So they've sent us a couple of videos. And here's Ellen introducing Haynes Junction and their International Mountain Festival. Hello, my name is Ellen Belosky, and I am, among other things, a professor at the University of Alberta. I am a resident most of the time of this community, Haynes Junction, also known as Dakwakata in Southern Chichone, in the Yukon. We're a mountain community. Behind us, of course, you see the St. Elias Range, which is the front range of the largest non-polar ice cap in the world. The people here who are the traditional residents have been here for thousands of years and they are known as the Don or Southern Tuchoni people. So we've come together this weekend to have our third actually Mountain Fest and celebrate Inter International Mountain Day and share it with you. Here we are inside of the St. Elias Convention Center where our Mountain Festival is centered for the weekend. Uh, by the way, it's minus 30 or west this morning, so some of our outdoor activities are a little bit curtailed. What we have here in the atrium, where you have the beautiful view of the mountains we just showed you outside, are all our recreational groups and artists. Over here we have Work by Lila, we have our local vintage store, we have the Backcountry Skiing Club, we have more work of the mountains by Sarah Davidson. So we want to share with you a couple of the things that we're doing here at our festival through clips. And we hope you'll come and join us next year. So that's a hello from Ellen Belosky. She's part of the Canadian Mountain Network in the Yukon and right now in Haynes Junction is where they are celebrating International Mountain Day. And as you could see from those shots, the mountains always inspire amazing art, but wow, those paintings are really fantastic. We will hope to get to a bit more of the celebrations in Haynes Junction if we have time later today, but first there's a shot of the webcam. Beautiful, beautiful view of the town there. We can see the St. Elias Range that Ellen pointed out in the background, and it 
is pretty chilly up there today. Before the wind chill, minus 25 degrees Celsius. Tonight, it looks like it's going to go down to minus 31 degrees. So there is good reason why Ellen there was bundled up. And we're going to be heading a little more south right now. We're going to be heading down to Banff to the White Museum Ar uh, Archives and Library. And that's where Brittany Watson joins me now at the White Museum. Hello. Hi, Meg. How are you today? Museum. Yeah, thank you so much. How are you doing today? Very well, very well. Is it, it just as cold in Banff? Uh, not that cold. It's only about minus two today. I'm falling outside. It's working out here. Wonderful. And of course, cozy inside the White Museum today, I'm guessing. Yes, no outdoor shots for us. <laughs> Now, Banff has such a rich history, and your job at the White Museum is to make sure that we have access to that, that you preserve these stories. For someone who comes by the White, what kind of stuff could they see? Well, we have quite vast collections here, both in the archives and library. Um, the library has many books, including all the books from the Alpine Club of Canada Library, which you're going to hear about in a little bit. Uh, we have plenty of photographs to see everything from about 1880s up to now in our archives um, lots of other objects and artifacts to view here we also have an extensive heritage collection and many paintings that you can also view that uh, sort of cap off that heritage of the rockies setup we have here wonderful and you also tell a lot of the stories of the mountaineers that have, that have come through the Banff region. And I understand you, you have made a video telling us about one of those mountaineers. Who's that? Yes, um, my colleague and I, Nicole Ensing, made a video for all of you to watch uh, about a guide and outfitter named Bert Riggle from Waterton. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll play that now. Wonderful. Hello, my name's Brittany Watson, and this is Nicole Ensing. We work here at the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies in the Archives and Library as archival assistants. Today we're going to share with you an important collection from our archives, the Burt Riggle Fong. The Burt Riggle Fong contains approximately 13,000 photographs, two meters in textual materials, and several cartographic records, all documenting the life of this outfitter, hunter, trapper, naturalist, photographer, writer, and guide. Bert Riggle moved from England to southern Alberta in 1904. He secured a job at Craighurst Farm near Calgary, where he met his wife, Dora. In 1905, Bert worked for the Correction Land Survey, touring southwestern Alberta. While Bert was surveying what is now Waterton Lakes National Park, he became enamored with the mountain landscape. In 1906, Bert and Dora married and moved to the Waterton area, where they homesteaded and ranched until 1946. By 1909, Bert was running a guiding and outfitting business, leading numerous hunting and fishing excursions in the area. Working with his wife, Dora, Bert led trips throughout the Rockies, Yarrow Canyon onto Bighorn Pass, the Avian Ridge Trail, the Continental Divide between Alberta and BC in the South Castle, and Akamina Ridge. These trips fueled Bert's lifelong commitment to exploring, photographing, and writing about the area. The photographs in this collection are both documentary and aesthetically stunning renderings of Rocky Mountain life and landscape. The images speak to Riggle's relationship to the mountains, hunting, ranching, and guiding juxtaposed with his attention to geology, plants, and animals in the area, and the effects of his activities had on particular species. Bert Riggle's photographs are representative of the indistinct line between the use of the land that his livelihood depended on and his appreciation for the areas he wished to see protected. Bert's images take the viewer beyond iconic or popular views of the Canadian Rocky Mountains, exposing a distinct interpretation of life in the Rockies. Riggle's relationship to the landscape inspired an intergenerational commitment to mountain stewardship and conservation. Both of his daughters, Doris Burton and Kay Russell, became dedicated stewards of the Rocky Mountains. Riggle's son-in-law and business partner, Andy Russell, became an important figure in environmental ac advocacy through his writing, photography, filmmaking, and lecturing. The sons of Andy and Kay also went on to work on the preservation and protection of natural areas in southern Alberta and beyond. Notably, Riggle's grandson, Charles Russell, has worked extensively with bear populations in Canada and internationally. Bert Riggle's photographs, notes, 
and heritage objects articulate a unique narrative that contributes to our sense of place and how we today see ourselves in relation to the Rocky Mountains. Stewarding and preserving collections such as the Burt Riggelfong held here at the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies is important to researchers and in developing an understanding of the interconnectedness of mountain systems, including the environment, economy, and society. If you're interested in knowing more about Burt Riggle and his extensive archival collections, you can come visit us in the archives and library here at the White Museum. We are also hosting a show of his photographs from April to June 2017. We hope you can join us. From the White Museum, that's Brittany Watson as well as her colleague Nicole Ensing with a video on Canadian mountaineer Bert Riggle. As you can see, some gorgeous photos taken by Bert. And Brittany, it makes me think, like, imagine Instagram had been around at that time. The mountains would have been way more populated, like, right away. They're just so gorgeous. Yeah, the railway would have been right built right through Waterton, I'm sure. So <laughs> I'm sort of glad it wasn't, uh, wasn't available then, but uh, would have been a different time for sure. For sure. And it isn't just the stories of mountaineers that you have in the museum. We've talked a little bit about the collection you have, but the White Museum is also the home to the library of the uh, Alpine Club of Canada, is my understanding as well. Yes, it is. Yeah, there are, um, an ex it's an extensive collection of books that were donated by some of their members um, over the years, the Alpine Club is over 100 years old now. So this collection of books spans um, authors and topics from uh, around the world, but also, of course, specific to the Rocky Mountains, which um, Megan Walsh, my other colleague who's working with the Alpine Club Library, will tell you about in our in our next video. So I don't want to say too much. I don't want to give it away. <laughs> She's the one who knows the most, so I'll let her say that. <laughs> Wonderful. And so here's the second video that was produced by the White Museum. This is Megan Walsh telling the story of the Alpine Club of Canada's library based at the White Museum. Hello, my name is Megan Walsh. I'm an intern here about. at the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies in the Archives and Libraries Department. My core project is cataloging the Alpine Club of Canada's library collection. I've been doing shelf reads, cataloging new acquisitions, um, assessing the conservation needs of the collection, and my personal favorite, sharing the mass amount of mountain culture that we have here in this collection with the world through social media. The Alpine Club of Canada's library collection consists of thousands of books of all different genres. Histories, biographies, novels, climbing guides, mountain photography, and books on wildlife and ecological conservation. Not only do the books range in genre, but geographically as well. We have books from South America, Switzerland, New Zealand, Tibet, the United States, Canada, and Africa, to name a few. It would be difficult to share this collection simply through physical exhibits, and it would be a shame if the public missed out on such an amazing collection. So, through the power of social media, we've been endeavoring to share the collection with you, through what we like to call our shelfie series. Once a week, I have been selecting a book or a series of books to share on the White Museum's Instagram account. We take a picture of the cover or any interesting illustrations inside, give a brief description of what the book is about, and add a quote to go on the Instagram page. So far, we have shared six posts covering mountain art in Drawn, The Art of Ascent by Jeremy Collins, Adventure Filmmaking in The Adventure Game by Keith Partridge, Arctic Exploration, the second Grinnell Exploration in Search of Sir John Franklin by Alicia Kent Kane, Wildlife in Birds and Animals in the Canadian Rockies by Carrie Wood, Mountaineering Biography in Where the Clouds Can Go by Conrad Kane, and Skiing History in A History of Skiing by Arnold Lunn. We anticipate that researchers, locals, tourists, and mountain enthusiasts will find something new within the collection. We also hope that people will realize the important and unique role that books and print media held in archives and libraries play in today's digital world. Many of the books held in the Alpine Club of Canada's collection have additional stories other than the ones published within their pages. For example, this copy of A Climber's Guide to the Rocky Mountains of Canada from 1943 belonged to Edward C. Porter, 
life member of the ACC, and an avid collector of mountaineering books from around the world. In fact, it's his collection that makes up such a large portion of the ACC's library. Within the pages, we find a letter written in 1951 to Mr. Porter from another famous mountaineer, Georgia Englehard Cromwell, in which Mrs. Cromwell discusses their shared roots in the Canadian Rockies. We also find two photographs, one of Mount Chancellor and one of Mount Victoria. On each photograph, Mr. Porter has drawn in his ascent route, marked the date, who he climbed with, which in both cases here was well-known guide Ernest Foytz, and how long it took him to summit each peak. He even pasted in a note card from Dr. J. Monroe Thorrington, who was the co-author of this very guide, thanking Mr. Porter for notes he sent to Thorrington concerning his climb of Mount Victoria. Obviously, these books can offer readers so much more than just information. It gives people a glimpse into the lives of mountaineers and their roles in mountaineering history. If you want to see our shelfies for International Mountain Day and more of the Alpine Club of Canada's collection, check out our social media pages on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, you can always come and visit us at the White Museum in Banff. Happy International Mountain Day. Brittany, it looks like there is so much that you can find within the White Museum. <laughs> There certainly is. And this is just, you know, two small parts of, uh, of a huge collection we have here. What's your favorite artifact that you've discovered in your work there? Oh, my favorite. Uh, or most that's a hard thing to ask. <laughs> most interesting to ask a uh, photo person. Um, one of my favorites is actually one of the photographs that was in our video. It was a photograph taken near Waterton. Um, during a trip that Bert Riggle led uh, for the Lockwood family. It's from the top of Panorama Peak in Waterton National Park. And it is a panorama photograph from about the 19 teens, which is a very special technique uh, used by Riggle in his, in his work. So that, that would have to be my favorite, right? And that is actually something that you'll be able to see in the, the upcoming show, right, of Riggle's photography? Exactly, yes. Uh, the Archives and Library are producing the uh, show on Burt Riggle. It will open in April and run through June next year, 2017. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Brittany, and thanks for making the time to celebrate International Mountain Day with us. Thank you for visiting us here at the White Museum. Take care. Today is International Mountain Day. We're going to show you more pictures of mountains. Here's a shot from Banff right now, actually. Uh, just off of Elk Avenue, you can see, is that sulfur in the background? It's just a little, little too uh, foggy today to tell, but you can get a look from the town site there. Right now in Banff, it is about minus 18 degrees. There is a chance of flurries today, as we can tell by all that cloud that's accumulating. Now, if you are in the mountains or if you just love them, we'd love it if you got engaged on Twitter right now, hopped on Twitter. You can use the hashtag Mountains Matter. That's the official UN hashtag for International Mountain Day. So if you want to share your thoughts with the world, that's where they'll be able to see them. You can also use the hashtag IMD2016CMN. That's for International Mountain Day. Uh, Can Canadian Mountain Network. And if you want to check out more information, if you're not already on our site for the live stream, you can check it out at internationalmountainday.ca. Now this shot here is a webcam from Parks Canada. This is in the west end of Glacier National Park right now. And this one is looking east, right towards Rogers Pass. As I mentioned, it's at the west end of Glacier National Park. And if we take a look at the temperatures right now, it's minus 19 degrees right now and cloudy. We can definitely see those clouds there on the webcam, but gives us an idea of what's happening up near Rogers Pass right now. We'll take a look at what else is happening in the mountains right now. As I mentioned in Banff right now, we're looking at about minus 18 degrees in Jasper, where we're hoping to head shortly. It's currently minus 19 degrees. There is a chance of flurries there as well. Uh, Haynes Junction, which we may go back to later, as I mentioned, is currently around minus 25 before the wind chill. So it is definitely busy out there. 
And uh, again, it's International Mountain Day. This is our live stream. You can find us at internationalmountainday.ca. It's also where you can get information on the International Mountain Day Festival that's on this week at the University of Alberta. Tons of wonderful activities. Tickets are free, but you do have to register to go to the events. So if you are in the Edmonton area or you plan on coming through, through be sure to check out at internationalmountainday.ca more information so you can come and be part of the events. And there are some fantastic events that are lined up. I know that Bison Belong will be doing a uh, presentation about the re return of uh, Bison to Banff National Park, which is going to be pretty fantastic. Again, that is hashtag Mountains Matter, which is our UN hashtag. And you can also use the hashtag Mountain Portal. And of, we already stopped at Haynes Junction, and it's day two of their Haynes Junction Mountain Festival. So lots of activities there. But we also want to say hello to our friends in Canmore, where they have the Li Life at Altitude uh, event going on this weekend at Arts Place Canmore. And again, back to Twitter. It's really interesting to see right now who is using the hashtag Mountains Matter. Well, I'm seeing them in Spanish, in English, in French. So interesting to see the different languages, the people that may speak different languages, but all live within mountain communities. And uh, we can see some, some interesting comments, whether it's some people who have sales going on right now, it looks like, for International Mountain Day. And sometimes people are just sharing photos. We see here from Mountain Man Joel, it's a beautiful day in my hashtag neighborhood, hashtag rural. And there's just a photo with, uh, with the beautiful mountain range that he lives near. So lots of neat things that are going on right now. And you can check that all out online. I can see James Lomax has posted uh, Scaffold Pike, which is the highest in England, and a gorgeous, gorgeous shot of that. So be sure to head to Twitter and use the hashtag Mountains Matter um, because it is the UNESCO hashtag. You'll be able to see different posts from all over the world. The interesting thing about International Mountain Day, I think, is that it's not a very old day. This is, it's only been around since 2003, so this would make it the 13th, if I'm doing math correctly. But it does mean that there are, uh, there are lots of different ways to celebrate. People around the world are celebrating in different fashions, but it's still a relatively new holiday. It's something that we can make as we go. And whether it's Haynes Junction, where they have a mountain festival, where you can see wonderful arts and crafts, or at the same time, whether we, uh, you know, are celebrating it with a live stream or at the festival that's happening at the University of Al Alberta this week, there's a lot of different ways to bring together academics, experts, mountain enthusiasts, and even as we were just speaking with Brittany at the White Museum, people who dedicate, you know, their work to being able to research the culture and the history of mountain communities, which is very unique and such a, a great way to be able to, to remember how special of a region uh, of these re that these regions are. Again, that's hashtag Mountains Matter, the UN hashtag. You can also use the hashtag IMD2016 CMN or hashtag Mountain Portal. Again, it's the International Mountain Day live stream. I'm Meg Wilcox. Hopefully you're joining us at internationalmountainday.ca. If you are tweeting, it's hashtag Mountains Matter. You can also use IMD2016 CMN. And uh, if there's a possibility to throw to a webcam right now, it'd be great to take a look at some of the other things that are going on in the mountains here in Western Canada. We wanted to bring you a piece of a speaker from the Haynes Junction Mountain Festival. So you may have already seen earlier Ellen show us how cold and beautiful Haynes Junction is. It isn't just the art that she showed off that they have going on at the event. They also have some wonderful speakers, including Brent Little. And here is an excerpt or a video, I should say, of his presentation from the other day. Thank you very much for inviting me here to give a presentation this evening. Uh, this is actually the third mountain festival. Uh, the first was in 1985, National Park Centennial Year. And uh, at that time, I thought, well, what can we do to make a special celebration here to mark uh, Canada's 100th birthday and uh, National Park's birthday? And uh, at that time, the, a lot of the pioneers of the St. Elias Mountains were still with us. And I had the great honor to uh, meet a lot of them and uh, brought together uh, people from across uh, North America here in Haines Junction for the first pioneers of the St. Elias reunion. And that included a lot of very prominent uh, people that are well known in the geography field, 
Dr. Walter Wood, who was the instigator for the record for the Icefields uh, Research Station in the 1940s and continued his work right through the 1960s and continued a lifelong interest and love of uh, the St. Elias Mountains. Uh, Dr. Bradford Washburn, who had a lifelong career with uh, National Geographic, and uh, he made his first aerial overflight from Carcross, this is a pre-Alaska highway, uh, into the Kalani area in 1935. And you've seen his outstanding mountain photography in the front there. And I think he's considered one of the world's best uh, alpine photographers. Um, but the video I'm showing you tonight is on another individual, Norman Reed. He couldn't make it. He was in his 94th year in 1985. And he was skiing and had a small ski accident. So. But uh, he climbed Mount Logan in 1925. And at that time, um, they came in from uh, Alaska and took the railroad to uh, Cordova and uh, then made a one year's freighting of goods to the base of the mountain by dog team and then climbed the mountain and made the summit in June, I believe, 24th. 1925, it was minus 30 degrees Celsius on top of the sun. And you can imagine, they only had a picture taken by um, Israel Russell in 1890 to show them the way. They really had no idea what they were getting into. So, pretty amazing people. And these were all uh, people that were still with us in 1985. Then in 1997, we had the second mountain reunion. And this was to uh, mark the achievements of Bradford Washburn and Bob Bates, who climbed Mount Rotunda in 1937 by accident, really. They crash-landed on the far side of Lucania, and the pilot said, well, you're on your own, guys. I'm out of here. He flew back to coastal Alaska, and they hiked uh, over the top of Mount Lucania and over the top of Mount Steele, hiked out the Steele Glacier, uh, built a raft across the, uh, the river, and amazingly met the Jaco party was out on a hunt and came back to the what we now call the Marsh Line. So, pretty amazing stories. But uh, let me uh, have this old-fashioned VHS here. And there's uh, somebody up there that looks similar to me, but they had a lot more hair. And um, you'll be able to meet these people and talk to them. And I should also mention Monty Alford, who is another outstanding mountaineer, our own Yukon mountaineer. And he's the uh, one who has the uh, privilege of interviewing Walter Wood and Bradford Washburn about the 1925 long climb. So, let's hope technology still works. That was Brent Little at the Haynes Junction Mountain Festival just this past weekend, and that was supplied by the Canadian Mountain Network, Yukon. So thank you so much for that speech from Brent Little, talking a little bit about the history of the festivals up in Haynes Junction. I'm Meg Wilcox. It's International Mountain Day. We're celebrating with a live stream at the Canadian Mountain Network. I'm based at the University of Alberta. But we are going to be heading now back up to Jasper. Greg and Mike, tell me a bit about the Artist Guild and what it does. We are a uh, non-profit visual arts group uh, centered here in Jasper. We've been together for 15 years. And uh, in the course of those 15 years, we have operated out of uh, um, a real uh, eclectic um, uh, set of different venues. And uh, we're broadcasting this morning from the uh, lower floor of our new uh, cultural centre here in Jasper that we're very excited about. Wonderful. And so when it officially did the centre open? It actually opened on July 1st after a, a very long wait. Um, but uh, so we uh, currently are in our sixth month of operation. Oh, that's great. And there's something about people who live in the mountains and the creation of art, I think. There's such a distinct uh, connection. Uh, for you, being in a mountain community and being an artist, how, how do you see that connection playing out in your own community? Well, um, you know, uh, uh, formerly, um, there, uh, Jasper had a, a very small artist group, and uh, it seemed as though the uh, 
what drove that group was to essentially paint pretty landscape pictures for tourists. Um, over the course of time, our, uh, our vision has broadened and um, we now produce work in a uh, diversity of different mediums and the community looks to us um, for uh, visual stimulation and uh, just um, uh, the CS has also a, a link to the, um, uh, you know, the broader art scene nationally. Oh, Michael, tell me a little bit about your artistic practice. Okay, well, um, I was trained in Victoria at the uh, Victoria College of Art uh, many years ago. Started with uh, figurative art, but then we did an experimental year. We went into total abstraction, so I had the privilege of working with Jim Gordonier and Joseph Kyle and Bill Porteous uh, there, and uh, I was teaching there after my second year. And then um, when I graduated, I taught there at nighttime for, for four years. Uh, figure drawing and painting. Um, then I've kind of I've kind of been all over the map. I've lived in Montreal. I did a, a thematic residency in Banff at the Banff Center in 2005 called the Optic Nerve, and there was people from all over the world, and we explored uh, ideas uh, based on on well it, the theme the Optic Nerve, so it was quite quite open. And uh, I did a series of uh, paintings based on barcodes and. Uh, and uh, just inspired by barcodes, quite formalist in, in nature, colors. So you started in Victoria, made your move toward the mountains. How did you end up in Jasper? Well, I lived in Jasper far before that. I, I moved to Jasper in 1977, even before I went to art school. So I was always here for the summertime and I'd be away in the wintertime. And I'd had, uh, you know, uh, spaces of time of, two, three years where I'd be somewhere else. But I always came back to Jasper. It always draws me back. Even this last time I was away for five years and I did a huge circle and ended up back in Jasper. So here I am. <laughs> so you you have this established, you know, uh, guild that's been around for 15 years. There's a new cultural center at, at the town that's six months old. What are your hopes for the arts in Jasper? Well, ultimately, um, we, uh, Mike, Michael and I have been uh, quite motivated by the idea of uh, perhaps one day uh, creating a sort of Jasper Biennale, uh, which would be an opportunity for uh, visual artists nationally and why not internationally to uh, come together uh, in a sort of a festival environment uh, to exhibit, and we could, um, uh, you know, using the, the the cultural center as a sort of a core for that exhibit, we have uh, surrounding grounds that would be very uh, conducive to extended extending our displays, and perhaps involving the local restaurants and making it really exciting. Well, that sounds wonderful. There's so many biennales around the world that are so so well regarded. There's, there's no reason that you couldn't have one in, in such a unique community as Jasper. We think so, and that's uh, ultimately one of our, uh, one of our goals. And the uh, nice thing about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I was just saying the nice thing about uh, uh, inviting people from all over the place to engage is that um, we could uh, lend, it lends opportunities to things like installations both uh, exterior and, and interior in the gallery, which is something, a, a dynamic that, I haven't, that hasn't really been explored here. And I think it's uh, an important one, uh, especially when you think of the backdrop of worldwide, uh, more, uh, more uh, universally, I think uh, things like uh, um, installations are, are, uh, are, are probably essential to complete uh, a real overview of what, what art can be in a community. Wonderful. Well, best of luck with those plans and enjoy the new, uh, the new little cultural center. Thanks, Meg. Thank you, Megan.
That is Greg and Michael, and they are at the, Jas uh, the Jasper's New Cultural Center that is in Jasper, Alberta. I wanted to throw to another webcam. There we go, there's Lake Louise. We can see it is a foggy, foggy day. There's some snow out there, as there is always snow in December. Um, but we can see a few people that were out enjoying the weather from the Lake Louise cam. Like right now, around Banff, though I guess Lake Louise is a little bit, a little bit north. It's currently minus 18 degrees, so it's a chilly one in Lake Louise today. And this is actually a shot, uh, again, from Glacier National Park. This is from the west end of the park. And what you're looking at is a snowboard. And as you'll see, there's a little, uh, um, what do you call it, a uh, measuring stick on the side there. And what happens is that um, mid-morning, most days, Team, the team from Parks Canada, their, uh, their avalanche technicians, will clear off all of the snow. And so this is a way for them with their webcam to measure how much snow has fallen since they last came by. We're looking there that that looks at about five, almost five centimeters of snow that has accumulated since they last came by. So again, that is in, uh, that is at Glacier National Park and that's from the West End and that's their accumulation snowboard. Kind of a neat look at what the teams, the avalanche teams do up in the uh, higher altitudes because that is at 1,910 meters in elevation. And now you are currently looking at, as you can see, uh, the large cam from the Lake Louise Ski Resort. Currently minus 16 degrees at Lake Louise and it looks like there are many skiers that are heading out about to enjoy the slopes. It's a little cloudy out there, but still looks like a nice day, particularly on the groomed areas there for sure. That's at Lake Louise Ski Resort. Well, I'm Meg Wilcox. It's International Mountain Day, and that wraps up our live stream. Thank you so much for joining us today, for hearing stories from Haynes Junction, from Jasper, from Banff. We've been able to see some webcams from around BC, Alberta, and the Yukon. And thank you for hopefully engaging at hashtag Mountains Matter on Twitter. If you're using it, it works on Instagram as well. And if you want any more information about the upcoming International Mountain Day Festival that is happening at the University of Alberta this week, you can always head to internationalmountainday.ca for more information. And of course, for links to all sorts of wonderful projects that we've talked about today on the broadcast. So thank you so much for joining me and have a fantastic International Mountain Day.